Firstly, the French took over and colonised Vietnam back in the 1800s. Then, during the Second World War, the Japanese came in. The Viet Minh fought the Japanese with the aid of the West. The British then came in at the end of World War II to take the Japanese surrender in the South, the Chinese nationalists in the North. Then, the Viet Minh fought against the British and Japanese who got together to then fight the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh then fought the French, who were backed by the US. Then they fought the US and eventually defeated them. And it wasn't finished there, but we'll leave that. French, Japanese, British, French, Americans, voila. In Vietnam and in Cambodia and in Laos, millions died as a result of the Vietnam War. Around 58,000 Americans were killed and more than that took their own lives after the conflict had finished, after they'd returned home. So why did America? Why did the American government get its people involved in the Vietnam War. Welcome to Free Teacher. Well, most definitely it was part of the Cold War and it was part of the fight against communism. President Dwight D. Eisenhower himself said that 80% 80%, that's probably twice what Thatcher got when she got in for her um, length of time. 80% of the Vietnamese people, for their own reasons, would have chosen communism. Not as an anti-American anything. Communism as an economic choice. So, the Vietnam War, the American involvement in the Vietnam War was part of a wider, long-term strategy of containment of communism. Fact. The American government was determined to control, to contain the spread of communism, not only in Europe, where they were worried that the, pe the poor, impoverished people of Europe might choose communism, as well as might be influenced by the Soviet Union. It was in the developing world, in the third world. Where the European, con con where the European colonies were collapsing, the British Empire, the French Empire. Who was going to control these? Who was going to hold sway? Who was going to influence? Who was going to have power in these areas? Was it going to go communist? Or was it going to be capitalist? So it was in the developing world, as the colonies collapsed, that communism would be contained. The Americans heavily backed the French in their fight against the communists. They backed the French colonialists imperialists in Vietnam against the Vietnamese. They did this to make sure to make sure that the communists didn't get to fill that power vacuum part of containment. Truth was as well that the fear was that the French who are rather socialist think about their 1789 French Revolution the French would turn against the Americans and would vote in a socialist or communist government. So the US, as part of the political game that every country plays, wanted to keep France on side by supporting its recolonization of Southeast Asia in order to keep them sweet in Europe. Still, this is just the details of a containment policy. 
the American government backed, supported the French colonialists, the, the French imperialists, they, they, after the Second World War, America supported France getting its empire back in Laos, in Cambodia and in Vietnam to prevent it from becoming or from choosing communism. So, uh, American influence was here after the Second World War. The British came in first, took the Japanese surrender and, and attacked the Viet Minh. Who had been wartime allies against the Japanese. They even allowed the Japanese to keep their weapons and turn them on their old allies, the Viet Minh, for their own pol political reasons. After that, it was the French who came in and then were faced with a fight against the communists and the communists were fighting a, an American-backed France. So they were already here. Only when the French got themselves mullered at Dien Bien Phu in 1954 and that they were defeated did we then get more overt American involvement at first with military advisors and then an increasing escalating um, real military presence of ground troops and air force and napalm and artillery and all of the good stuff. Basically help the French get their colonies back so the communists can't have them. I argue that it was the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu that was the catalyst, the trigger for the Americans to get involved. Don't get confused, there are lots of different factors. There are the main ones, power, ideology, containment, part of the Cold War and the Gulf of Tonkin. leave that one for now. Um, we'll sort them all out and prioritise them at the end of the video so you're not confused, okay? But to have lots of information is nothing to be scared of. To try to remember it all is difficult, but to understand it once you've understood it, you'll be okay. One of the reasons put forward for, by the US for bombing this country was that they were attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin. Turns out to be a nonsense. That's the trigger. There's got to be a trigger. There's always a trigger. And it normally involves an attack upon the country that was waiting to wage war. Think about it. Ow! Mom, he hit me. Damn it. Vietnamese alleyways are really nice. So a Cambodian student of mine asked me the other day, we were doing the cause of this war and that war, and, and she said, ah, oh, there's so much information, I need it simplified for me. I, I said, okay, give me a moment and I'll sort out the causes of all war and put it in a framework so that you can understand. So I don't want to reveal any, any inside secrets here, and this is a very simple framework but it's a framework that's going to help you to be able to explain the cause of any war. Apply different details to the situation, yes, it's not all the same. However, if I think you, if you use this formula, you'll be on your way. So I'll give you the formula in a second. So, if you want to work out the cause of all wars and be able to answer an essay in a structured way and understand things. The cause of war simplified for GCSE. Here we go. Primary cause, the truth. Power. Power comes in all forms. Without power you have chaos. To say it was because of power is not necessarily a negative thing. It's just a reality on this testosterone filled jungle that we spin through space on. It's power. Power. 
number one fundamental primary cause. Then there will be the secondary cause. Ideology or belief, that'll be the reason put forward. An ism. Communism, Catholicism, that'll be an ism, a belief. So power and then a belief system, which will be good for making people feel that it's a righteous war. They treat people badly, they're horrible to animals, they do whatever. So power, the truth, then there'll be a belief system that's put forward as the reason. Then there'll be a series of catalysts or one single trigger. There'll be a trigger to trigger the war that was going to happen in the first place. Three steps. And if you can spot these, you've got it. You've got your essay organized. You don't need to get confused. You don't need to get all jumbled up. You've got a nice flow to your essay. You're differentiating and seeing the links between the causes. You're on for an A grade. Thank you very much. Working out the cause of war, as a Wolves fan, having a coffee. Simple. So, the truth is power. Number two, there'll be a belief. Three, trigger. So, power. Communism versus capitalism. The belief. The trigger. The Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, Cuba, 1898. Power. Belief. The Cuba, the Spanish are cruel, backward Catholics who are horrible to the Cubans. The trigger. The, the sinking of the main. The explosion in, in Havana Harbor of an American warship. British, em British Empire. Right. British Empire. Power. We need to export Christianity to civilize the natives. A trigger somewhere. An ambush, an attack. The, the Zulu Wars. Go in there and start a war because we want to take that land for power. We'll say that we're civilizing uh, the black people by bringing them Christianity. March your army in there and go and create and stir up some trouble so we have a catalyst. One, two, three. Three stage step to war. You know about it, you can then populate it with a few facts and pass your essay. Right, that's me dead. Some of you might be saying, yes free teacher, that's if you want to call me, if you're weird enough to call me that. It's all well and good. But what about money? Surely economics and money. Of course, yeah, 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 that's the details. Money is power, power, power and money are, are completely interlinked. What about religion? It's the justification part. You'll normally find be behind most religious wars, someone is gaining power. Someone's making money. So, I'm not saying I can tell you or the cause of everything ever, you know, but I do have Johnny Ansell's unified theory on war for GCSE. Second World War, that empire. Power, power games, political power games. Reason? We had to defeat the worst man in the world ever. National socialism, this ism needed defeating. Fascism needed defeating. Power, the reason, the trigger. British promise to protect Poland being one of the triggers. It follows the same pattern. I've just passed your GCSE history for you. You don't have to thank me. So the reasoning, the reasons for the war in Vietnam, if we follow this framework, it's power. The details change, obviously. 
who was going to have power, who was going to control the post-war world as Western colonies collapsed, who was going to fill the power vacuum. You have a growing power in the United States. It wants to project itself like every other empire since the Romans and before. It is growing into a position of world dominance and it has decided to contain communism. So the war in Vietnam is part of this power game which has got an ideological justification and a flavouring to it which is a war uh, uh, to contain communism, to defend freedom. This is part two, the, the justification. Um, it's part of a power game like the Second World War, the First World War, the Falklands War, whichever war. And then the, 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 there's a, there are catalysts, there are more short-term causes that help for the French in, in Vietnam. Um, the DNBN food, the French losing. And then the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which is put forward as the reason why the United States enters the war in Vietnam. It was attacked. That's the justification. I'm just saying that this follows a rather familiar pattern. Power, justification, trigger. P, J, T, system. We could talk about it being uh, good against bad, against evil, right and wrong, good is and bad is. But if you really believe that that's the case, really why countries go to war, You've been watching too many cartoons when you were a kid thinking that good violence beats bad violence and it's goodies and baddies. Come on. Of course, often the trigger and the justification are linked. We were attacked. They attacked us. So therefore we had to go to war. But you don't slaughter millions of people because you, you know, won, you were attacked. Not, not in that way. There has to be a deeper justification that lasts. A war against something bad, which the people can fight and die for. So to summarise, the reasons why the United States went into a war in Vietnam. It was a power game, part of a political, geopolitical power game to have power in the post-war world as European colonies collapsed. It was an ideological war against communism, capitalism versus communism, part of containment. The United States had been trying to help the French as part of the containment policy and failed the French, lost in Vietnam, and then the American military stepped in when they said that they were attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin. Personally, I think it's fair to blame testosterone, bad parenting, and military uniforms and guns being cool. Okay, when we say that it's a power game, geopolitics, it's politics, it's about power. This is not a unilateral thing, this is not just one party running around and seeking power and nothing else is going on in the world. The context to this, why the United States saw itself involved in Southeast Asia, was part, of, you know, was, was containment and communism. And it's worth noting that the French were beaten by the Vietnamese who were being helped principally by the Chinese, the Chinese communists who under Mao had taken power in 1949 and to the US after seeing the USSR come through Eastern Europe 
and take their, their, their buffer zone. They saw Eastern Europe, they saw the USSR, and then they saw the fall of China, the fall of China, and they felt the need to stop communism there and then. I will be critical of politicians, I will be critical of powerful people and governments and military and all of this because I don't like war and I don't like war, I don't like suffering, I don't like any of these things. But that's not to say that I would side with the communists. I would say that the US was the most powerful country the most powerful military in the world at that time and still is. However, what happened in China, for example, was real. Mao took over China and his rule was pretty crazy and pretty brutal and personally given the choice whatever the faults of each system, segregation in the United States, racism, etc, etc. I will nail my colours to the flag and say that I would rather live under that capitalist system. My heart, in a lot of ways, has something for communism because I see it as a quality. But that's not the way it works. Collectivization under Mao was not a natural, not a healthy way of being. It doesn't mean that super right-wing ultra-capitalism is healthy either. But I would just like to clear up that thing that there is a real historical context here that the leaders of the US were not just involved in some big scam. I don't think they're particularly honest with their people, It's my opinion. But also I don't believe that I would have liked to have lived under the Soviet rule. I'm sure some of it was fantastic. I've spoken to people who've lived in the Soviet Union, who lived in communist Poland. And certain parts of it were comforting. There was a certain amount of security, job security. You know, there was a safety net. There was a feeling of brotherhood for a lot of people. But there was also a lot of frustration. There were, there, there's both sides in each country. I think what I rail against sometimes is just the idea, because it seems ridiculous to me, that Britain did this, America did this, the USSR did this, like everyone just rose up as one, when most obviously countries are not monoliths. Countries and governments and organisations contain factions. So anyway, part of the geopolitical game that's worth remembering was that the USSR had gone communist China had become communist in 1949, the Chinese had helped get the French out of Vietnam and that the domino theory to some people, this is an excuse for war, to other people was extremely relevant and they did believe that communism needed to be stopped out there before it became the dominant system in the world. It's okay to say, well, yeah, they were weak. You're, you know, you're picking on the weak, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, agreed. No one likes to see it. But in politics, I think often unpleasant decisions have to be made about what will happen in the future once the situation changes and once your potential adversary becomes much more powerful than he is today. I'm not saying I like it. I'm just saying there are elements to ruling that all of us would probably rather not know about. Decisions to be made where someone is going to come to some harm. I wanted to clear this up. Thanks for listening.